Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Simple Church. How we doing? Good. I'm glad y'all are here, and I'm so thankful for John sharing his story. That video, it was so good, John. Thank you. Talk about a life transformed, and just jumping in with both feet into the family, and it's funny because he's like, well, what else can I do? But he's doing all the things. Like, if you've served in any capacity at Simple Church, you've probably served alongside John. So, John, thank you for sharing your story. Kaylin and Cody as well, sharing their stories the last two weeks. It's been so powerful getting to hear from people, from, from their experiences of walking through church hurt, of walking far away from God and, and being found again and being a part of this family. So welcome. My name is Matthew Reed. I'm the journey pastor here. People call me Rito. You can call me Rito if you want to. We've been in this amazing series about the parable of the prodigal son. Remember, it's a story that Jesus made up to make a point about the kingdom of God. And Pastor Jay has absolutely killed it the last two weeks. And uh, I, I, I thought it was good anyway. I mean, <laughs> no, it's been great. It's been so good. And if you haven't watched those, go back to our YouTube channel. Go check those out. It's absolutely foundational for what we're talking about today and for where we're going. And so uh, the last two weeks, the first week, we really focused in on the Father because the parable is ultimately all about the Father. He is filled with so much love and grace and compassion and kindness for his kids, more than we could ever imagine. And then the next week, last week, we talked about the younger brother who went and took his share of the inheritance and squandered it all in wild living, but came to his senses and turned back to his father to find that he was welcomed back home. It's that turning back that we find God in. And so I just have to ask, because this week we're talking about the older brother, and it's kind of funny, when Jay first told me a couple months ago he was feeling led to do a series on the prodigal son, I immediately asked him, can I preach about the older brother? And I'm just going to blame the Holy Spirit for that. I don't know why, otherwise that would have popped into my head. This is not an easy thing to preach about. And so I'm just wondering in the room, in the sense of this parable that we're about to read, are, are there any older brothers in here? I sure am. I sure am an older brother. I appreciate y'all being honest with me. I know that's not easy to do. I realized about 10 years ago, to my horror, that I was an older brother because I'd always identified with the younger brother. I was the one who'd gone astray and been lost, and then Jesus had come and found me and brought me back. And so I'd always identified with that younger brother until about 10 years in, and I heard this parable preached and realized, oh, wow, I done got good at religion. <laughs> and realize that I'm the older brother. So we're going to dig into this today, and this is a message for you older brothers, and I think probably all of us will realize we're somewhere on a spectrum between the two. We're some of both brothers in the story, and wherever we are, we turn back to God. So will you pray with me? Almighty God, we need to hear from you today. Holy Spirit, come and open our hearts and our minds let yours be the only voice that speaks today, not mine. Jesus, open your word to us. Draw us closer to you. Wherever we are, would you help us turn back to you? And may we shine your light in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So we remember the parable. It says the father has two sons, and the younger son says to the father, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my share of the inheritance. I want to go do me. And the father, in his great love for his boy, won't force him to stay there with him. So he gives it to him. And my man goes off and he's trying to live his best life, which lasts for a minute, <laughs> until he runs out of money that he spends on all the wild living. And then the friends run out too. It's funny how those two things go together. And then he finds himself feeding pigs. And he's longing for what the pigs are eating. This is about as low as it could get for a faithful Jew of Jesus' day. And it's there that he wakes up. He finally realizes, what am I doing? He comes to a senses. He, he says, my father's servants have it so much better than I do right now. I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell him I'm sorry. And I'm going to say, will you just make me one of your servants? And so he starts the journey back. 
But before he can really even get his speech out, his father has already seen him from far off and run to him. And remember, it was super undignified for a man in that culture to run, especially to someone who had done wrong like this. But he runs to him. He wraps his arms around his boy. He puts a robe on him, says, come on in. Let's kill the fattened calf and have a big old party because you're home. And it's right there that we're going to pick up this account and meet our older brother friend. This is Luke 15, 25 through 32. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends because we all know that's a party. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. The father said to him, Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. My friends, this is the word of God. Can we just say something that's really obvious here? It's not fair. It's not fair. Can we all say it together? It's not fair. Everything the older brother says is true. He's absolutely right. The the younger brother took everything, went and squandered it on wild living. The older brother stayed at home. He did all the stuff he was supposed to do. He worked in the field for his dad. He did everything he was supposed to. He he dressed the part, looked the part, did everything right. And when this younger brother comes crawling back, he gets a hero's welcome. And meanwhile, my man didn't even get to have a barbecue with his friends. It's not fair. But the kingdom of God's not about fair is it? Because if the kingdom of God were about fairness, everything that I have coming for me for all the times that I've done wrong, for all the times I've been selfish, hurt people, turned away from God, God help me if I get everything that is coming my way. It's like the parable of the vineyard workers. It's in Matthew 20. I'm not going to read it to you this morning. But the owner of the vineyard goes out to hire day laborers. And so he goes out, finds some people, they get to work. He goes out a little bit later, hires some more people, goes out a little later, brings in some more people. And then right at the end of the workday, brings in some more people to work. And then it comes time to pay the workers. And so he pays the people who'd come last first and gives them the full day's wage. And then the people who'd worked all day thought, oh, this is great. We're going to get even more but then they get the exact same. And they're upset because it's not fair. But it's not about fair. They don't understand the radical generosity of the owner of the vineyard, the love and compassion that he has. Just like the father in the parable we're talking about. The kingdom of God isn't about what's fair. It's about radical grace. Love and mercy that we can't imagine. But we can miss that when we get stuck in big brother mode. Don't get so busy being right that you miss being right with God. If we can, I want to walk us through just a little bit of religious history So if we can just kind of put our our history class caps on and I'll be Professor Rito for just a moment. Because we come by this really honestly. We come by this tendency to be big brothers really, really honestly. And I want to start with the Pharisees. They were the predominant leaders at the time Jesus was walking around Israel. And what they had done with, I, I think, the very best of intentions, they'd built what they called a hedge around the law. 
Because by the time Jesus was on earth, the Israelites had been conquered, carried off to exile. They'd gotten to come back to a shadow of their former kingdom's glory. They'd been conquered and reconquered and were currently occupied by the Romans. And they were desperate for God to come and restore the nation to its former glory. And they figured the best way we can do that, we are going to obey the law so carefully so that we can honor God completely. So with the best of intentions, the hedge around the law. And the idea being, if we don't cross the hedge, then we won't cross the law, right? It makes sense. And so an example. So the law of God says, do no work on the Sabbath, which was revolutionary to Hebrew slaves who'd never gotten a day off in their lives. All of a sudden, they have to take a day off. Well, they said, okay, well, what's work? I know, if I don't go more than a thousand steps, then I won't have done work on the Sabbath. So they built the hedge and said, we just will make sure we don't take more than a thousand steps. Or similarly, so the Sabbath was from sundown to sundown, right? So they added a couple hours on each side just to make extra careful sure that they didn't do any work on the Sabbath. And that's fine and that's good if you want to, but the problem was the hedge became their new law. So when we read through the Gospels, everything that the Pharisees criticized Jesus and his followers for doing violates their hedge. It doesn't violate God's law. Does that make sense? So their hedge became the new law. Now fast forward a whole bunch of years to our American experiment. Remember, the Puritans were fleeing from religious persecution in England. They were seeking religious freedom, which was to become a fundamental American ideal, and that's one I hope we never lose. But what they meant by religious freedom, they actually just wanted to be free to be the new dominant religion and put people under their thumbs and make them follow all their rules. Basically, big brother then. Fun fact, the first place in our country that gave true religious freedom? Rhode Island. Go Rhode Island. Yeah. <laughs> so the church thrived in America, despite our very best efforts to obliterate it with legalism. And then in the 1800s, this movement started to kind of coalesce in Germany, and it's called liberalism. And it's not to be confused with political liberalism, although the two sometimes go together. It was theological liberalism. What they started doing was they started criticizing the scriptures. And from the way they read it and understood it, they believed it hadn't been written when it was said to have been written, and it was not written by the authors that the Bible says had written it, okay? Now, I think their foundation's faulty. I'm not going to go into all that today. If you want to have that conversation with me, I welcome it. I believe we can rest uh, very securely knowing that our, our Bible manuscripts, the, the Bible you hold, is very, very accurate to what was written and, and recorded in the early days. But what they took that to mean was that the Bible was more of a series of metaphors, of analogies, kind of patterns for us to follow. So they didn't think that Jesus was so much the literal son of God made flesh who lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross to pay the penalty we couldn't repay, was raised again from the dead. They viewed it more as a metaphor for us to follow, that we should live lives of sacrifice and devotion to God, doing as much good on the earth as we can. They had this idea that there was this like God consciousness that was in us and that when they heard preaching and teaching of this way, it kind of awakened that God consciousness and then they wanted to do social works to help spread this God consciousness. So some of that is really good. Their focus was on the kingdom of God being here and now and certainly it's easy for us to lose sight of that truth. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what happened was... This philosophy in the late 1800s, early 1900s started to wash ashore in America, and pretty quickly, the more theologically conservative Christian leaders, which I would say we're a more theologically conservative church, started to realize we had a problem because they realized people were getting confused. They thought if we call on the name of Jesus, then th this new teaching they're hearing about Jesus must be what we're all about. So they wanted to draw a really clear line between us and them. So they formed a little holy huddle which we're so good at forming holy huddles, aren't we? And in the 1920s, they got together and they published this pamphlet called The Fundamentals of the Faith. Have you ever heard the term fundamentalist? Yeah, it ain't a nice term, is it? This is where it came from, from the fundamentals of the faith. And here's the thing. Everything that pamphlet says, I believe is true, and I believe is accurate, and it's important to hold on to those beliefs. The problem was 
It was very much the holy huddle, us versus those people over there. We're not like those people. We don't have anything to do with those people. And their huddle got so bad, they actually quit doing the works of social justice because they didn't want anybody to get confused with them. So they wouldn't feed the homeless, care for the sick, help the orphan, the widow. And I think our our holy huddle got even worse in the 60s and 70s because the church was reacting to the hippie culture, to the free love, to the drug culture, those movement that just seemed to turn society on its head. They didn't want anybody to get confused with who they were and who they weren't. So the huddle got a little tighter and it became even more about what not to wear, what not to do. The church became known for who it's not (laughs) rather than who it's for. And I think this holy huddle reached its kind of peak in the 90s and early thousands with the, uh, the moral majority. Y'all remember the moral majority? And uh, the evangelical voting bloc that really became more of a political movement than a move of God in America. And church, I think we're all in danger of becoming the older brother. And I think that spirit lives outside the church, but I just want to take a moment and talk about inside the church, and most certainly not the people in this room, right? But I'm going to paint with a really broad brushstroke, make some sweeping generalizations to try to make a point, okay? Not, not triggering uh, individual people in here, hopefully. Traditional versus contemporary worship. Have any of y'all been in a church where that worship war is going on? I sure have. And it's amazing how people will take their preference and elevate it to the level of being sacred, and then look down on others who don't share that preference. And it's fine to have our preferences. It's fine to think that our preference is right. It's not fine to look down on others who believe differently. Kind of in the same vein, uh, different beliefs of, of different churches. It's like, well, thank goodness we're not like that church down the street. They do all that wackadoodle stuff, right? <laughs> I don't even want to give specific examples. I want to, but I don't. But The point is, it's so easy for us to say, well, we're not like those people who believe those things and do those things. I don't know why y'all are those people over there. I'm sorry. Y'all are great. You're beautiful, beautiful crowd over here. (laughs) I'll make these people those people over there next time. Even within the church, we're not safe from political conflict. Conservatives versus liberals. Those people over there believe all this nonsense. We know how things really ought to be run. I don't know if I can even have fellowship with those people over there. They believe this and that. It's amazing. And again, it's fine to have convictions. It's good to have convictions. It's good to have conversations. It's good to disagree well. But when we divorce ourselves from being in community with people who disagree from us, we miss out on a lot. We miss out on a lot of growth and a lot of refining that God wants to do in us. And again, certainly not in this church family, but sometimes the older believers have a hard time with the younger believers, right? Because the older generation was raised different about how you went to church. You dressed a certain way. You did, you were were quiet. You did what you were supposed to do. You honored God like that. And the younger generation is throwing some of that on its head. And like tattoos, for instance, right? Tattoos are now really widely accepted in mainstream culture. But when Pastor Jay and I were kids back in the 1900s, they were still really taboo. (laughs) Basically, you're either in a biker gang or you're a sailor, right? I mean, that was was about it when we were kids. (laughs) We're young men. But it also goes the other way. I've noticed this younger generation of Christ followers, they have this beautiful hunger for a deep spirituality. They want a thriving spiritual connection with Jesus, and they're seeking it, and they're finding it. And as good as that is, they can start to look down on those who don't share that. It's amazing. Our ability to take something good that God has led us to and weaponize it against others. And I'd like to share an example with you from my own life, if, if I can just be really transparent with you for a few minutes. I'd like to share with you my own journey with alcohol. So I grew up in the Presbyterian tradition, which uh, believes that alcohol in moderation is fine. And perhaps our tradition can, can turn a bit of a blind eye to excess, but for the most part, moderation is okay. And 
I believe that as well. I believe in, in Christian liberty on the issue of alcohol. And I think we can make a really strong biblical case against drunkenness, against excess, because it leads into all kinds of destructive behaviors and it can pull people away from God. But I believe we can't make a biblical case for no alcohol ever. Now, I understand why some faith traditions have done that. They've said, we've seen the dangers of alcohol and we just don't want anything to do with it, so we're just not going to drink it all ever. And in so doing, we build our own hedge around the law, right? So I believe in Christian liberty on drinking. But when I went to college, I went wild. I was in a dark place and I drank to excess for a long season of my life. I abused alcohol. And thank God I never got to the place of physical dependence, which I know people who have, but I was emotionally dependent on it. I I couldn't handle basically any life stressor without going and drinking it away. And I was in a really dark place when Jesus found me. And I quit drinking altogether when he found me for a pretty good season. But then I decided I wanted to start taking some steps back into moderation. And so a lot of my 20s kind of found me in this cycle where I would kind of start drinking in moderation a little bit, but then I'd realize I was starting to drink a little bit too much again. It was becoming a thing again. And so I'd back way off before trying to step back into moderation. And I don't know how many times that cycle repeated. Now, by the time Miranda and I got married and I was in my early and mid-30s, I really feel like I'd found a place of healthy moderation with it. And so then I was very surprised about seven years ago, my oldest daughter, Audrey, was about six months old. I heard very clearly from God, I felt led so strongly to give up all alcohol, okay? And I was ticked off, one, can I just, I'll be real with you. I was ticked off because I'd finally gotten to a good place with something that I actually enjoyed, and now God is asking me to give it up, right? <laughs> but I said, okay, Lord, if, if this is what you want, I'll do it, but I need you to take away the desire for it. And he did. In his great grace, in that moment, he did. I I tried to step into obedience, and he met me there. And um, it's been a gift. It really has. Here's the kicker. Here's where the older brother comes back into the story. And I hope you hear my heart, because I'm I'm really going to be vulnerable and transparent here. When I meet fellow believers who still drink in moderation. It's like there's this older brother, like devil on my shoulder. He's like, hey, because he talks like Batman. He totally talks like Batman. Hey, uh, you're like way further down the road than those people are. And you're like super spiritual and you're doing great, bro. And they're terrible Christians and blah, blah, blah. And the second that nonsense tries to spring up in me, I've got to kill it. I've just got to take that spirit and kill it dead because that's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. I don't have room to judge anybody after all the nonsense I've done. And my heart is just to love. And truly, I believe in Christian liberty. But that spirit, it's amazing. God led me to this good place on my journey with Jesus. I can't enforce that on others. But the big brother in me, just the big brother just wants to big brother. And that's the Pharisee in me. And here's the thing. Jesus was telling this parable of the prodigal son against the Pharisees. They were the big brother in the story. They'd built this hedge around the law, and they were so busy being right that they were missing the movement of God in their midst. And we don't know how the story ends. We don't know if the big brother turns away from his rightness to go back into relationship with his father and his brother or if he sits off to the side and just keeps pouting for the rest of his life. And I think because it ends like that, it asks us a question. Who are we? What are we going to be about? Are we going to get on our little holy hill with our holy huddle and be right? Or are we going to turn back to our Father, a Father of unlimited grace and mercy and love, and be in relationship with him, and be in relationship with people that maybe we don't think deserve to be there. That's what it always comes back to. It's not about what those people over there are doing or what they believe or anything else. God always brings it back to asking us, what do you say? What will you do? Will you turn back and walk with me? 
or you will be stuck believing that you're right. My friends, don't let being right keep you from being right with God. It all comes back to repentance. It's what Jay preached about last week. Whether you're the the younger brother who's followed a long trail of destructive behaviors that you need to repent from and turn away from and turn back to God, or whether you're the best, most legalistic older brother that the world has ever seen. Or the reality is, again, we're, we're all kind of a mix, right? The point is, we all turn back to God every day. Jesus says to take up your cross daily and follow me, right? To die to ourselves, to turn back to him. Because our Father, the God who is revealed to us in these parables, is filled with limitless mercy and grace and love and compassion. He gets it. He gets what you've been through. He gets what you're about. He gets your hang-ups. He still wants to welcome you home. He wants you to be in relationship with him. So I pray that God would give us the grace to all continually keep turning back to him. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I can't thank you enough that your kingdom isn't about what's fair. Thank you for the grace and mercy of Jesus. And thank you for the invitation that wherever we are, whether we've wandered far away from you or whether we've, we've got hard hearts, that we can turn back to you, to meet you, and that you meet us right where we are. Jesus, would you help us do that? Help us not get stuck being right and miss being in relationship with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services at 9 or 11 on Sunday. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.